This is the first part of a two-part lecture on Ignacio A. Acuria's 1985 essay on the liberating function of philosophy. The goals of this essay, according to A. Acuria, are to first continue uh, his response to uh, the instruction on some aspects of liberation theology, a document written uh, and produced by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith at the Vatican under the direction of uh, Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict XVI. Uh, we heard about this essay earlier, and this is part of A. Acuria's um, response to uh, the criticisms of liberation theology that Cardinal Ratzinger advanced in that essay. Uh, this, this current essay is also meant to establish the metaphysical uh, substance of liberation. What, what is the, the ground of reality that underwrites uh, the drive, the desire, uh, and the efforts at liberation? And then finally, he says it's to root Catholic philosophy in historical realism. And Aacria's view a lot about Catholic philosophy at the time had become abstract and mostly about itself rather than about uh, the world of actual Catholics, the world of uh, people uh, in their historical reality. Uh, so those are the, the, the goals, the overarching goals of this essay. Um, he says that Latin America lives under conditions of structural oppression. There's, there's no doubt that that was true uh, um, in his time and in ours. Uh, Latin America, he reminds us, has not produced a philosophy of its own. So we're back to that question again of what would count as a Latin American theology, as we talked about in the last uh, uh, essay that we studied, uh, what would count as a, a truly Latin American philosophy. That's part of the concern of A. Acria here. He says, he asks a question, you know, why not produce a Latin American philosophy, which, if it is truly both Latin American and philosophy, would become a universal theoretical practical contribution and would also exercise a liberating function together with other theoretical and practical efforts on behalf of the popular majorities who are living in a secular state of oppression, repression. Well, that's a big why not. That's a big, that's a big ask. Uh, what he's after here is like, well, can, can we come up with a philosophy that's truly Latin American, that's rooted in our historical reality, uh, a thinking, a way of seeing uh, that comes from our concrete situations here in Latin America, a situation where, uh, where the majority are poor and oppressed by the powers that be, uh, but it would still have to be philosophy. It couldn't be simply idiosyncratic. It couldn't just be our own thinking here without reference to universal ideals and principles. It would have to be f truly philosophical. And he said this, this, the, this Latin American, this distinctly Latin American philosophy that's still to be developed would make a contribution beyond its own scope, beyond just the situation of Latin America, uh, and would serve not just to be a way of seeing, but also a, a way of doing, a, a praxis that could, in conjunction with other efforts, help lead to the liberation of the poor majority. He says, uh, to define the liberating function that corresponds to philosophy here and now that would be effective in liberating the whole of culture in order that people attain self-realization freely. Now, I'm going to point to attention as we go along here in this idea of trying to make efforts to help others self-realize. If you think about it, to self-realize, and again, realize doesn't mean like it just dawned on me. Realize means to make real, to live up to our potential, to make use of our capacities, to actualize our possibilities. Uh, we, and we need to do that for ourselves. Uh, and and so, do the, so does the poor majority of Latin America. So how do you help someone do something for themselves? How do you avoid the possibility that you're doing it for them in some ways or determining for them what liberation would be like or determining for others the goal of liberation? That is going to be a problem that we need to confront as we go along here. Uh, the world is filled with people who are trying to give us advice, tell us how to live, tell us how to be, tell us what's best for us. But we need to know for ourselves how to live and how to be and what's best for us. We can't do that in a vacuum. 
uh, we have to rely on, on uh, help, if you want to put it that way, from the thoughts and, and efforts of others. But there's a tension there between doing it ourselves and, and having it done for us. Uh, Martin Heidegger, in his book, uh, important book, Being in Time, talks about the relationships that we have with others, and he categorizes them in two ways. He says, in some, some cases, we, he says, leap in for others. And what does that mean? We, we take over for others. We determine what their possibilities are. We determine how they get actualized. And anybody that's ever been a parent has done some serious leaping in. <laughs> you can't just let the toddlers decide for themselves what would be best for them. They're, they're not ready for that. But that's not necessarily the way to be with uh, our fellow adults. So Heidegger says there's a different kind of relationship that's, that he deems leaping ahead for others. And what you do there is not take over the possibilities of the other, but you help them find those possibilities for themselves and help them to actualize for themselves their possibilities. And so we have this tension between leaping in, trying to say what it ought to be like for others, even with our best of intentions, even trying to help as, as, as much as we can. We might be leaping in for others. We might be taking over for others. We might in despite our best efforts, be contributing to the problem. What we're after, I think, is what Heidegger would call the leaping ahead. I think what, that's what Aya Korea is after. Try to find a way of philosophizing that allows other people to be uh, autonomous, to think for themselves, to live for themselves, and to choose for themselves and their freedom. Uh, now, he, he says here, you know, we, we want this philosophy to, to be for the, the majority, he says, but I'm not talking about what we, what we call popular philosophy, which is the, you know, the kind of philosophy you get in three-minute YouTube videos that explain Kant's philosophy you know, in cartoons. <laughs> you know, yes, it's very accessible, but it's probably accessible because it's, it's wrong. <laughs> it's misleading and wrong in fundamental ways. So I'm not talking about dumbing down philosophy for the great masses of people. And I'm not saying that the great masses of people have to become technical philosophers, that they have to become academic philosophers and get their PhDs in order to be liberated. We've talked about this. Uh, but again, that means there is a, a, a tension here. It, 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 for Aya Kriya, it means the place from which philosophy must be done is that of the poor majority. We have to start from there. We have to find the right place to do philosophy because we always are doing it from some place. And the place from which we do philosophy will impact the kind of philosophy that we do. It will impact what, you're, what we're able to see and what will be prevented from seeing, depending on the place. Aya Kriya continues in this essay to talk about the relationship between reason and freedom. He says, on the one hand, reason always has to do with freedom. The exercise of, freedom, of, of uh, reason leads to freedom from ignorance uh, and from falsehood. So reason can be liberating just in its very use. The exercise of reason requires freedom from need, oppression, and, and, and uh, oppression. It, it requires that. Uh, th this passage reminds me of Book 10 of Aristotle's Nicomachean Ethics when he's talking about philosophy. He says, look, it's self-sufficient. It's something you do, but it's very hard to do. It's very hard to see what's really going on. It's really hard to, be, uh, to exercise our rational faculties when we're, when we're on the run, when there's, we're in a war zone, when we're, uh, we don't have a roof over our head, when we don't have food in our bellies, uh, we, we need freedom in order to exercise uh, reason. But then he says, on the other hand, uh, reason has been used to suppress freedom, to quash dissent, and to maintain unjust institutions and, and practices. And he, he calls out what he calls mediocre practitioners of philosophy. Uh, who give philosophy a bad name. They give it a dogmatic or a tyrannical character that basically says, look, here's what you think, say these words, and, and more or less quit thinking for yourself. I've done it for you. Uh, that, that is not a, a, a use of philosophy that leads to freedom. It's a use of ph philosophy that prevents freedom from thought, prevents freedom from philosophizing for yourself, which is the only philosophy that, that ultimately will, will matter to you is the that which you do your, yourself with others. Uh, the search for truth cannot simply be for its own sake, uh, Aya Kriya says. He, he, he's thinking of uh, the Gospel of John, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. Or he could be thinking of Marx's Thesis 11, which we referred to uh, earlier. Philosophers have until now only tried to understand the world. The point is to change it. It's not knowing for knowing's sake, 
It's not knowing sitting up on a mountaintop well out of a, a wicked game, as Nietzsche would say. Uh, reason is, uh, has an ethical uh, import to it. It's not just about knowing, but about doing. The search for truth has a bo both a theoretical purpose and a practical purpose. So to know and to act equals what we've been calling praxis. Uh, to, to know without acting is not ideal. To act without knowledge, without knowing, to act foolishly, unwisely, certainly that's no good. What we want to develop for ourselves uh, is a kind of praxis, a, 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 an, an activity uh, undergird by a quest for, for wisdom. He brings up again these two functions of philosophy, the critical function of philosophy, which is the, the activity of disideologization, and the creative function of philosophy, or ideologization. Uh, ideology, he defines again in this essay as the coherent, comprehensive, and evaluative explanation through concepts, symbols, images, references, etc., which goes beyond simple, fragmented observation, both in narrow areas and especially in more general and even all-embracing areas. It's seeing, it's trying to see the big picture uh, of our world and our place in it. It's necessary, as we've been saying all along. It's useful. It's important, both personally and socially. Uh, it is always present and it's always effective. What he means by that is there, there is no place without ideology and ideology is always operating, like it or no. So the, therefore, it could be positive. It can help us see what's really going on, or it could be negative. It could prevent us from see, seeing what's really going on, or it could be, as he says, neutral. Um, uh, he says we need theoretical explanations and justifications, in other words, ideology, and they must carry at least the appearance of truth. So even an ideology that, even, even if it were designed to prevent the masses of people for seeing how things really are. It would still have to, in some way, look like truth. It would have to carry at least the appearance of truth. And he says, this is, you know, this explains why people will cling to ideology that masks reality as well as that which clarifies it. Because uh, an ideology in its negative sense, in its pernicious sense, which throws up an obstacle to seeing what's going on, when it's really effective, it's really effective because it looks like truth. Uh, he talks about this idea of value-neutral science. You've probably heard that phrase in your, uh, along your educational path so far. Uh, the positivists uh, claim that we must avoid value judgments as being non-scientific. This comes from uh, that uh, split in reality that, that Rene Descartes left us. Uh, we, we may have talked about Descartes a little bit where he was on this uh, quest for certainty, an epistemological uh, a bug uh, that he was trying to, to, to deal with. You know, how can I be sure of anything? And he said, the answer is you, you have to cut a big chunk of reality off from the rest. The part that you can weigh and measure and publicly uh, examine and take apart and put back together again and uh, assess in terms of mathematical physics, in other words, it's quantifiable, that kind of reality you can have certainty about. And you can have certainty so long as you push everything that does not lend itself to that way of analysis off to another side. But what you're pushing off to another side are our hopes, our fears, our emotions, our passions, our desires. You can't determine, for instance, uh, which is the true religion. You can't do an experiment. You can't do a science experiment to figure that out. You can't look at it under a microscope and try to look at its part. It just doesn't, that's, it's not that kind of thing. It doesn't lend itself to that kind of analysis. Uh, and, and therefore, on the Cartesian view, that just means it's all mere opinion. And uh, a positivist view of science is one that wants that kind of Cartesian certainty, and it gets it by uh, splitting reality asunder. Uh, and taking only those parts that could be quantified and understood mathematically and physically as providing us with certainty. Any addition of our values into that process just muddies the waters and gets rid of our uh, certainty. 
But values are all important. We live and die for our values, do we not? So reason, Aacrius says, cannot be equivalent to modern science. Modern science can contribute to what it means to be a reasonable person. But it's not identical with reason as such and putting aside all other ways of knowing and encountering the world and each other as somehow just mere opinion uh, is a tragic error, Aacrius would say. So there's uh, at least three types of rational explanation, and, and we'll, we'll see this expanded when we get to the, the work of Enrique Dussel. But first, there's the idea of common or good sense, you know, life experience, uh, a kind of natural logic, a popular or folk wisdom, uh, gets a lot of people and a lot of societies through a lot of uh, eons of time. Uh, not, not too badly. Uh, hard to say that that's unreasonable. Uh, and then, of course, there's you know, critical thinking, critical exercise that makes explicit its own presuppositions and makes use of methods and proofs and system, systemizations and the assessment of consequences and so forth. Uh, this is the kind of thing, again, that you, you do together. And then finally, you can narrow that down uh, uh, more, more precisely to the methods of the natural sciences, which are epitomized by that quantification, by that mathematization. Uh, that's a very narrow view, very powerful, but a very narrow view of what it means uh, to be reasonable. This, again, uh, A. Korea's uh, uh, understanding of the, the richness of reason and rationality is also coming from Zubiri, uh, who, who, who also argued for a much expanded understanding of what it means to be reasonable than just the practices of modern mathematical science. So back to the idea of ideologization, he defines it this way on page 99 of that essay. It un unconsciously and unintentionally expresses visions of reality that rather than manifesting that reality, hide and deform it with the appearance of truth because of interests shaped by classes or social, ethnic, political, and or religious groups. Now you'll note here that this particular definition of ideologization is all negative. It's a negative concept. It's, it's, a, it's a hiding reality. Uh, from uh, the, the majority of people. It deforms our understanding of reality. Uh, Aacrea is not 100% precise in how he uses these two terms. I'm trying to keep it a little bit more simplified as we go uh, 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 to the best of my ability. Ideologization is, in a neutral sense, a process of trying to do what we need to do, which is develop lenses for seeing reality. It's neutral. <laughs> Whether those lenses are clear or not is the issue. Whether those lenses give us a good access to reality, to what's really going on or not, that's the crucial question. Here, Aya Korea is just talking about that process in its negative sense, in the sense of developing lenses that prevent people from seeing what's really going on. So it's a negative concept here. Uh, and he talks about in detail uh, between pages 99 and 100, he, he says, Totalizing, interpretive, and justifying vision of a specific reality in which important elements of falsehood and or injustice are hidden or disguised, right? Preventing us from seeing that injustice, preventing us from, from noticing the falsehoods as much as possible. This deformation, he says, has a certain collective and social character which works publicly and impersonally. It is not necessarily the case that there's some mastermind behind this negative ideologization that's going on that's pre preventing the rest of us from seeing what's really real. No, the, the ideology is in the atmosphere, so to speak. It's in the water. Uh, it, it operates impersonally. It operates behind the scenes. It operates tacitly. Uh, I, I'll refer again to uh, Martin Heidegger uh, and again to his masterwork, Being in Time where he talks about the, the, the pervasive influence of what he calls the they. And we do that all the time. You know, they say you should eat your vitamins. They say you shouldn't watch too much television. Who are they? Where's their office? What's their email address, right? It's not referring to anybody, really. Who is that they? No, it's a kind of an ideology. It's a word that Heidegger doesn't use there. It's a kind of an ideology a kind of a way of seeing the world that nobody really is totally responsible for. It serves certain interests and prevents the interests of others from being served, but it kind of happens in the background. It kind of happens as the horizon for our understanding what's going on. 
uh, he continues, uh, unconsciously responds to collective interests which determine the ideologized represent representation in what it says and what it does not say, what it distorts and what it deforms. It's presented as true both by the producers and by the receivers of this ideology. It's presented as universal and necessary, a general formulation or abstraction used to justify concrete situations. It is what it is would be the motto of this kind of ideologization. That's just the way it is. It appears therefore innate or natural or my way of putting it just dropped from heaven. No one made it up. It just is what it is, perfectly natural and there's nothing you can do about it is the implication. That's a false implication. So uh, every social system again needs ideological legitimation, needs ideology as such for survival and effective functioning. That's the, the positive aspect of ideology. Ideologization is the, the, the negative here. This is how he's using it at this, in this stage of the essay. When the social system is unjust, it goes beyond ideology, uh, uh, what we need in order to see things, to ideologization. And you can hear here that he's using it just negative uh, at, at this part of the essay. Uh, it presents us, he says, with nothingness no being, no truth, no reality that nevertheless appears as something, appears as reality, falsehood that appears as truth, non-being that appears as being. That's this negative view of ideology or what he's calling here ideologization. Uh, philosophy arises or progresses from dissatisfaction, uh, an exercise of its critical function. When, when, when we get a whiff that ideologization in the negative sense is going on. It's about questioning and dissent. It's about doubt and negation, as he put it in that essay, what is the point of philosophy? Uh, uh, philosophy must stay in contact with reality. Uh, it's not just about the critique of other philosophies as such. Philosophy classes, books written on the history of philosophy, tend to make the, the, the critique of philosophies a, a thing in itself. One philosopher critiques the one before and then the next one critiques that one and it's all about philosophy. But philosophy isn't about philosophy or shouldn't be about philosophy. Philosophy should be about reality. Philosophy should be about life, our human life together. Um, I, I just wanted to point out here uh, Aya Kriya's uh, criticism of Marx's critique of religion. Uh, you know uh, that one of the, the uh, knocks on liberation theology is that it's just Marxism with a Christian code of paint. Uh, it's part of the cr criticism uh, that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger uh, uh, posed against liberation theology. But here you could see A. Kriya says, no, Marx's critique of religion is in need of critique, even on its own terms. Both, both from the scientific point of view, the historical materialism, does, does Marx really understand what's happening you know, with religion? And from a philosophical point of view, the dialectical materialism uh, of Marx's view. All that itself, Aya Kriya says, needs to be reassessed, uh, reinterpreted. And again, if there's something good worth taking, take it. Uh, but don't just buy into it. Uh, that would be a, a long discussion for another day. But just pointing out that uh, a. Kriya is criticizing Marx's view on religion here. He's not adopting him un unthinkingly. Uh, philosophy must be fundamental. It must be metaphysical. It's a search for foundations, for the arche. That's that Greek word that means both beginnings and principles or foundations. The reality masked by the nothingness of ideologization. One of the ways that you unmask ideology is, is in A. A. Kriya's view, and this would be Zubiri's view as well, is by undertaking metaphysics, which sounds like something you do in philosophy class. No, it's a search for the ultimate grounds of reality. It's a very practical concern. It's a profound concern. Uh, I, I do want to point out, though, that um, anti-foundationalists and anti-metaphysical positions have been the more accepted view in philosophy, in professional philosophy, since you know the, the, about the middle of the, the 20th century. Uh, there's plenty of uh, books and essays and conferences that have somewhere in their title the end of metaphysics or overcoming metaphysics. Let's not do metaphysics anymore. 
it was in in my you know uh, graduate education always a, a, a term of criticism. Oh, that's just metaphysics, or that's just being metaphysical. That was a, a swear word. It was a bad word. It was a crit criticism word. Uh, Zubiri is not afraid of the term metaphysics. A. Kriya is not afraid of the term metaphysics, and neither am I. Uh, but but why though? Why where did all this negative uh, uh, response to metaphysics, trying to figure out the ultimate grounds of reality, come from. Well, here's why, and A. Kriya knows it, and 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 and, and so do I. Uh, it's a position that seeks, uh, excuse me, a position that seeks ultimate and totalizing foundations risks slipping into ideologization, which is the negative term in this essay. When you say, you know what, I think I've discovered the ultimate grounds of reality, and I can draw a bunch of implications from that. If you take yourself too seriously when you get to that position, you effectively have come to the end of thinking. You're basically saying to yourself and to others, I've, I've thought it all through. It's over now. Philosophy can be done with. We don't need to ask any more questions. We don't need to look at this anymore. I've got the answer. That's definitely a problem, and uh, it has real-world consequences. For instance, if you're doing the metaphysics of the human person, what does it take to be a human person? That activity has uh, been undertaken uh, through the millennia, and every time there's a definition of what counts as a real human being, somebody gets left out. They get left out because their economic class or where they come from or what language they speak or what religion they practice or what their gender is or their sexual preferences are or their race or whatever. They get left out. Time and time and time again, somebody has a metaphysical view of what it means to be human that draws the circle too narrowly. But notice, every time you draw a circle, there's an inside and an outside. Every time. And the worry of the anti-metaphysical philosophers is that, you know, drawing the circle is leaving something out. It's being unjust. It's being unfair. It's missing something. Those of us who are willing to still engage in metaphysics ought to understand that point. And I think that point ought to be a counsel of humility. Uh, be humble. It is important to try to find out what's really real. That's important. We need to do that. We can't just quit doing that because it's risky. But we also have to remember that it's risky. We don't want to become just another ideology that doesn't help us see reality, but prevents us from seeing reality as best as we can. Uh, in pages 102 to 103, he gives a little mini history of metaphysics. He starts with Aristotle's idea of uh, natural being, substances, th things that uh, of a particular uh, form, uh, uh, the, the, the metaphysics proper, I would say. Uh, then he, he turns to Descartes through Kant, the idea that the philosophy is refocused from the world to, to the knower of the world, to the subject, to the I think, the, the cogito of Rene Descartes uh, to the, you know, the, the structure of reason in, in Kant's uh, philosophy. And then the third turn to uh, historicity, which includes uh, an understanding of ideology versus ideologization uh, of praxis. And I would say we've gone from metaphysics as first philosophy to epistemology as first philosophy here to ethics or politics as first philosophy. So in this third stage, uh, we start talking about Hegel, who brings history into philosophy, to Marx, who was very influenced by Hegel's uh, dialectics, uh, through to what we're talking about now, liberation philosophy and liberation uh, theology. Uh, when I use the term first philosophy, I don't mean the first thing you learn in school. I mean the fundamental things. What's most fundamental? Uh, what is being? That's metaphysics. Or what can I know for sure? That's epistemology. Or how should we be? What should I do? That would be ethics or politics. And the history of philosophy has gone through more or less these three kinds of stages. Some caveats or warnings here. Philosophy cannot affect social change all by itself. Let's say that again. Philosophy cannot affect social change all by itself. It, it is not a superhero. It's not going to swoop in and fix all your problems. And, oh, I took a philosophy course, I, and now I can fix the world. Nope. It's an ingredient. Uh, in fixing the world, but it can't do it by itself. Uh, philosophy also needs to be self-critical for all the reasons I just said. 
uh, because philosophy does not take place in a vacuum. It takes place in a concrete uh, historical situation, and it's determined by certain social relations and certain institutions and structures, and it's configured by I ideologies just like everything is. So philosophy always needs to pay attention to where it's happening, what are the preconditions for it ha it's happening, why do we read these people, why do we ask these questions, why do we talk about it in terms of these concepts. Philosophy always has to be reflective in that sense. It needs to think about the world, but it also needs to pay attention to itself. It can't become self-absorbed. Philosophy can't be philosophy about philosophy only. Then it, then it has no social relevance whatsoever. Uh, but it can't go storming off into the world as if it has a clear understanding of its own practices, as if they're completely pure and free of all the ideology and value neutral. No. Uh, interests are always at work, and we should be aware of what interests are driving us. Uh, the basic requirements of philosophy, uh, the creative function, the, the ideologization in the good sense, which is not using in this essay here, uh, is the creative function. It needs a theory of intelligence or human knowledge, as we learned before. It needs epistemology. Uh, intelligence can liberate, but it can also oppress and constrain. You know, people use their minds for... Uh, nefarious purposes, don't they? Uh, we need a theory of reality as such, as I've been saying, metaphysics. I don't think we can get beyond metaphysics or overcome metaphysics unless we just quit thinking. Uh, we must consider both natural and historical, objective and subjective, and social and personal aspects of reality to get a, a full picture. We need an open and critical theory of the human being, of society and history, a philosophical anthropology and a philosophical politics. And we need a theory that provides uh, the rational foundations for evaluation. Is this good or not good? Or to show why we, we might not be able to get that, that would be a philosophical ethics. And then we need a reflection on the ultimate and transcendent. Uh, Kant's question, for what may I hope, that's a philosophical theology in, in Zubiri's sense of the word, uh, which would be open to anybody, religious believers or not. Philosophy must always recognize uh, that which one wants to be liberated from, the mode by which one will affect liberation, and the goal of historical freedom. And you've heard me mention those questions and, and uh, also the question of for the sake of which do we want to be liberated since the beginning of the semester. So here it is again. Uh, it means, uh, according to Aikria, that philosophy will always be diverse, it will always be plural. There can never be just one philosophy. One of the things he might have in mind when he makes a comment like this is that in his own formation as a, uh, a Jesuit uh, priest, he was taught philosophy uh, of St. Thomas Aquinas and probably very little else except for the fact that he sought out Zubiri and, and, and went in that direction. Uh, uh, Catholics, uh, Catholic philosophers were taught basically Aquinas <laughs> uh, and, and nothing else. And with the Vatican II and the opening up of the the church to the world and, and, and vice versa in many ways, uh, new thought th systems were um, able to be explored, uh, integrated, uh, compared in ways that really hadn't happened before. And the idea uh, became that there can't be just one philosophy. Now that is a question that's continuously debated by philosophers, uh, but in Eddie Korea's view, and Zubiri's view, it would be necessarily diverse because humans are necessarily diverse. Now, you know, it's not by accident, not by happenstance. We are pluralized beings, as Zubiri taught us. Philosophy requires liberating praxis to be effective. Uh, think about what he's really saying here. In order for philosophy to be philosophy, to, for philosophy to be what it's truly meant to be, it requires not just an exercise of a kind of knowing, or kind of thinking, but that praxis of being and living and choosing and acting in certain ways. Philosophy, though, he, he quickly says, will always have its own autonomy. The classic um, example of that is uh, logic. Uh, logic is not directly related to you know, a particular world historical situation. For instance, if A then B, and if B then C, you can conclude if A then C. And we don't need to know what A, B, and C are or when they were, or anything like that. Uh, logic does have its own uh, autonomy. And he says, look, that aspect of philosophy can be directly liberating. It helps clear up muddled thinking and uh, confusions. And so logic is very important, and we, we should all 
uh, work to hone our logical skills. Uh, that's good not just for philosophy, but, but for life. Uh, uh, liberating function of philosophy depends on our orienting uh, focus or, or foci of more than one. What orients our thinking? What kind of questions are driving us? Uh, uh, w w where are we looking? Uh, it also depends on our social and historical reality in two senses, I think. First, uh, the, our social historical reality ought to give us the raw material for our philosophical uh, efforts, and we need certain social historical uh, capacities in Zuberi's sense to even do uh, philosophy. So it's a, it's, it means it in both those senses. The dominant interests uh, in that reality will uh, have an effect on what we're able to think and how we're able to, to behave, what our praxis will be like. Uh, it's going to depend on the horizon, as we've talked about that term a lot, the horizons that frame our activities, our philosophical activities, and, and how, what the implications are for that. And again, just to remind you, a horizon is a limiting and enabling. It makes possible, but it puts limits on. Uh, a background necessary for understanding. If there's no ground, then there's no figure. And that horizon includes interests, concerns, aspirations, social pressures, uh, political situations, and on and on. Uh, he, he writes, so if philosophy as a theoretical moment is to carry out its full liberating capacity and also fulfill itself as philosophy, it must consciously and reflectively recover its role as the appropriate theoretical moment of the appropriate historical praxis. That's a big way of saying it needs to be relevant to our historical reality. Philosophy, he says again, uh, gains enormous benefit from a deliberate incarnation in that praxis as philosophy, as the way of knowing that philosophy represents. Liberating praxis is not only a principle of ethical correctness, but also of creativity, as long as we enter into it with a theoretical quality and intensity and maintain a critical distance. Philosophically, it is not enough to seek the truth, but also to try and realize it. Again, that word is a verb. Realize is to make real. Realize it philosophically in order to do justice and establish freedom. Philosophy must take a critical distance from the dominant praxis. In order to do philosophy, uh, you, you have to be able to take a step back from what's going on. Philosophers, he says, aren't bureaucrats. You know, we're not checking the papers of the, the citizens of the, you know, the, the ruling um, ideology. And philosophers aren't cheerleaders for the status quo. It's not our job to prop up what people are doing now without question. That's, that's, that's not our job as philosophers. But critical distance doesn't mean remoteness, where you step away from society and, and turn your back on society or just imagine you, you get out from under it. That can't happen. He says, what it means is the telos, or the end or aim or goal of philosophy, wisdom, takes time. It means you have to have patience. It means you have to have tolerance. Uh, you, you, you can't just accept what's going on now uncritically and just quit thinking, because no good will come of that. He says, the philosopher can understand the need to tolerate some evils, and that the present of some evil does not make a project, a vanguard, or a state power evil. Now, that's a passage you want to look at once or twice or three times or more. Uh, what, what is he saying here? He, 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 I think he gives the, the Latin uh, for this saying, an action is good if it is good in every respect, and evil if it's evil in any respect. So in order to be good, it's got to be perfectly good. If it's not perfectly good, it's bad. Right? Now he says that is not applicable in historical matters. You can't, you can't really apply that in life. Life is more complicated than that. So what he's saying is, since our efforts are diverse, they are not comprehensive. And because they're not comprehensive, they're going to contain elements that are negative bad, possibly even evil. And what he's trying to say is, if you wait around for per perfection, you will get the opposite, <laughs> because you won't get perfection. No one will be pure. So, for instance, uh, you know, it comes time to vote for candidates. 
or their public policies. You say, wait a minute, if it's not 100% purely perfect, I can't support it. Well, then you can't support anything. What Acre is saying is in the rough and tumble of human life, uh, things will not be perfect. And uh, we have to have some tolerance for continued ignorance uh, and some tolerance for some, like, for some even possibly for, for some evils, for some bad behaviors. Now, I, I definitely think this is worth thinking about. I think it p puts its finger on a, a, the difficulty of ethical and political life for us human beings, that it's not neat, it's not tidy. Uh, and the question is, well, how much of that can we tolerate? How, 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 how pure do, do we have to try to, to be in our understanding, in our, in our behaviors, uh, when it comes to righting serious wrongs? Uh, if, we, if we're only making incremental progress, does that make it bad? Because we haven't gotten to the goal line. Aya Korea is going to argue that it does not make it bad. Uh, he's quick to point out that philosophers should not rule, which is the exact opposite of what Plato thought. Uh, Plato thought that the philosopher was uh, wise, or at least loved wisdom uh, before all else. And if one were wise, one would do good. Uh, Aacrius says no. Uh, the person who's a philosopher is, is really not fit to be your ruler. Ruling takes something else. Ruling takes the ability maybe to take what we heard a moment ago to heart, to say, look, it's not going to be perfect, but I'm, I got to do something. I got, I got to make a move here. Some people are going to get hurt, but I think in the long run it's for the good. And, and I'm talking about a a good-hearted, good-intentioned politician, a good-intentioned ruler. Philosophers uh, maybe are just constitutionally unable to let it go, to keep asking, like a Socrates. And, and Acrius says Socrates should be commended and supported. Society needs their Socrates. Uh, Socrates himself said that at his, his trial. You know, he's sentenced to death. He says, well, uh, try to figure out who's going to be better off here. I mean, me, I'm, I'm going to be dead. And maybe that's, you know, we think that's bad, but who knows. Uh, but you're going to be without me, asking you questions, asking you to give an account of yourself, asking you to, to define your ideals and try to live up to them. Are you, are you really going to be better off without me? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a gadfly. <laughs> I'm stinging you all the time. I'm a thorn in your side. But are you really going to be better off without me? That's what Socrates was asking in his trial. And Aacrius would say, we're not, we're not better off without our Socrates. In order for philosophy to develop its full liberating potential, it must be undertaken by the subject of liberation. Uh, and who that is, Aacrius says, will vary from situation to situation. Uh, and, and that raises the question for us, can we engage in liberating philosophy? Are we ourselves the subject of liberation? In the sense, are we the ones who need liberating? If, if we are, then we are fit uh, to undertake philosophy because it's our own existence is, is, is driving us, impelling us in that way. But, but what if we're not? Philosophy as such can, can creatively develop ideology that inspires conversion, a metanoia in Greek, a change of mind. Uh, it can. Philosophy can do that. Philosophy can be effective that way. But always remember that a change in ideas does not automatically result in a change of reality. Uh, remember what, what we talked about when we talked about uh, Marx and materialism. Uh, in fact, a change in ideology can be a means of avoiding social change. It can happen. So, so philosophy, uh, coming up with a, a good ideology that helps us see reality, can be inspiring, can help us to change our mind and to go out in the world and do different things. Uh, but also, it's a, it could, could work very well as a cover-up, <laughs> uh, and it frequently has. Uh, at the political level, the main contradictor, as he, as he puts it, those suffering oppression may not be the best uh, suited to bringing about liberation. The ones who are in trouble may not be best equipped to overcome that trouble. At a theoretical level, uh, we must situate ourselves at the place of the the principal contradiction, the place of historical truth, the place where liberation needs to occur. Now, now we're back to that question that I, uh, or that tension that I raised for us at the beginning of this talk. Uh, how are we going to do that? 
if, if we ourselves are not the main contradictor, where, where the contradictions of all the public ideology are shown uh, in their brightest light with the suffering of the, the, the bulk of humanity, if we're not a part of that ourselves, if we're closer to the one percenters, as, as we might say, uh, uh, are, we, are we really fit to, to do liberating theology? Uh, and, 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 and to get fit, are, are we able to situate ourselves in the place that we ourselves naturally are not, or happen not to be, I guess I should say? Can we do that? Can we put ourselves in that position? Uh, that is a fundamental question for all this liberating praxis that we've been talking about. Uh, can we serve as the vanguard? Uh, vanguardism is the idea that, uh, you know, listen, you guys don't really know what's going on, but come with me if you want to live. You know, I, I know what's best for you. You don't know, sorry, you've been oppressed and therefore you're ignorant, so you don't really know. But I know, I can see what you can't see. Follow me and I'll help you. I'll fix you. I'll take you to the promised land. Uh, and is it their promised land or is it what I think their promised land is? Um, that's always a question. It's a question in, in, in life, uh, just like it is in politics. You know, when we say, I, 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 I love the other person. Do I love the other person? <laughs> or do I love my idea of the other person? I say, I want what's best for them. Is it what's best for them? Or is it what I think is best for them, which happens to be a lot like what's best for me? <laughs> which is that? Well, that's what's good. I think that's what the tension is here as well. Can we really think in the place of someone else? Can we really get there? Because a lot of, of liberation philosophy and theology hangs on the premise that we can do that, that we can somehow get ourselves in that place uh, to be able to think from where the contradiction happens, where real reality shines through. Not the veneer, not the, not the, 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 the whitewash, but the real reality. Uh, it requires, you know, to find the place of liberating theology requires theoretical discernment. You know, we have to figure out where that place is. And it also requires an enlightened opting, you know, an eth the ethical commitment uh, that A. Akri is always talking about. We, we have to, he says, resist the injustice that suppresses truth. That's coming from R Romans. And, and by the way, in that passage, it says that, that whatever injustice that's suppressing truth, that's going to... Um, uh, provoke the wrath of God, it says in that passage. So it's, pre it's, it's pretty bad. We have to, to opt for that which allows us to see the truth. Uh, he says on 114, and you should read the whole context here, but he says in part, this choice to situate oneself in one location or another uh, when doing philosophy is one of the most important distinguishing characteristics among philosophies, not only from an ethical standpoint, but a theoretical one as well. So figure out where you stand and where you ought to stand if you really want to see what's going on. Uh, where is that? Where shall we, you and I, where shall we situate ourselves to do this? All right, well, I'll let that question hang in the air. We'll take a break and we'll pick it up in the second part of this talk. <music>